All right, hello and welcome to our second webinar of the academic year, Navigating Complexity from Explorers to Experts, featuring Dr. Paul Schutz. My name is Allie Holmes, and I'm a doctoral candidate at Purdue University and the senior graduate student representative for the Complexity Theories in Education SIG. The purpose of the SIG is to advance, apply, and extend complexity theories to inquiry, research, theory, and practice in a variety of educational contexts. Next. Today we have uh, Professor Paul Schutz, who is a professor emeritus at the University of Texas at San Antonio and an affiliated member of the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Arizona. His research interests include emotions in education, teacher identity development, race and ethnicity in educational contexts, and research methods and methodologies. He is the past president of the American Psychological Association Division 15 Educational Psychology and the former co-editor of the Educational Researcher Research News and Comments. His recent publications include Teachers, Goals, Beliefs, Emotions, and Identity Development, The Evolution of Race-Focused and Race Reimage approach Approaches, sorry, in Educational Psychology, Future Directions for the Fields, Reconceptualizing Teacher Identity Development, and the Handbook of Educational Psychology, 4th edition. Dr. Schutz will deliver his presentation and there will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Such as he discusses his story, Depends on the Storyteller, Restoring from an Ecological Dynamic Systems Perspective. Well, good evening, all. Thanks for uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, the uh, get things set up here. Uh, I'm going to try to um, get a lot of screens here that <laughs> I didn't expect to be. Okay, I think we're good now. Uh, can you guys see the screen and stuff? All good. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of my more recent interest. Before I get to that, I wanted to go back in the day a little bit, and uh, I've been thinking about sort of systems theories, things, complexity for a long for a long time. I guess uh, actually, when I I went to um, I went to college to be a wrestler, and I decided. And I ended up in a philosophy class and had an interesting Dr. Sheehan was his name. And he had us do reading uh, Von Bertalanthe and Paul Weiss back in the early 70s. Uh, and so that's really where I got interested. And in. you notice the second one uh, by Paul Weiss, the cell is not in Ireland entire of itself, uh, which you know, speaks to sort of that complexity thing. And he he was a biologist. So some of these earlier folks were in biology and physiology and things like that. Uh, and then uh, in my doctoral work, I, at the University of Texas, I, I tried to go back a little bit in time uh, and ran into folks like uh, William Cannon, who, was talking about physiological homeostasis, you know, like a good doctoral student. I was working my way back to, uh, you know, the earlier writings. Uh, and then also uh, Donald Ford uh, was was something I read. That, that book was like 800 pages long. Uh, and I think the font size was like seven. Uh, so it was quite a task at, at the time trying to read some of that. But, so I, I, a lot of words to say that I, I've been thinking about some of these ideas for a long time. Um, so the current, my current question here is, uh, uh, it's not progressively displaying, but I'll, I'll move on. The current, the question I want to talk a little bit about tonight is something I've been thinking about here. And 
one of the things that I keep trying to think about is uh, one of the things we think about in sort of systems theory is this idea of these levels and so how uh, sort of so what I'm thinking about is how do these social historical cultural historical contextual factors faculties factors to develop our understanding of belonging transactions in and I'm going to focus a little bit on historically white colleges and universities. So in other words, uh, can we take, can we use some of the things we learn in history uh, and try to figure out how that might influence belonging in college classrooms? So that's the, that's the thing. Now, this is kind of a, I've been putting these ideas together. So I feel a little bit about like a, a comedian going uh, out on the road and uh, trying out some new material. So there'll be holes in, in the ideas and your job is to help me find the holes and, and tell me how I can think about it better. So make sure you need to find at least three holes in my logic tonight. That's your, that's your assignment. So now one of the, recently I read this article by um, Gloria Lanson Billings and uh, one of the things that I think is important before I go into sort of how I might try to think about these things is what I refer to as our inquiry worldview or basically our philosophy of science. And I read this last week and I thought, wow, that's, you know, and what she said is basically all methodolo methodologies have biases. All methodologies have assumptions about the nature of the world. And the methodological task for researchers is to determine which biases and assumptions they can live with. Okay, so what I want to do is before I get into this, is to talk a little bit about uh, my inquiry worldview and some of the assumptions that I make. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Schutz, uh, we can't see your slides. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. If you could probably, you can probably click on them. Um, yeah. On the side. Because we're still, we can still see the first one. Oh, okay. Are they moving now? No. All right. Uh, let's stop and try again. Still the same one? This is back in the day. No, this first one back in the day. Current project. Okay, then we're moving forward. All right. All right. So, talking about our inquiry worldview, philosophy of science, I want to do a quick run through on some of my ideas or what I, I think, what I see here. Uh, and so, as of six o'clock tonight, before I started on 19th of November, 2024, uh, I'm going to talk about some of my assumptions and basically uh, uh, your philosophy of science or your inquiry worldview deals with some of your ontological uh, thoughts. What is the nature of reality? Your epistemological beliefs about what is the nature of the knower knowledge and your philosophy of science. In other words, what is the nature of inquiry? Uh, and so here I, uh, I want to talk a little bit about here, my first assumption is that our realities are basically socially constructed, okay? And so let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, sex, we sort of think about as a binary, male, female. Uh, it's interesting that there's been a lot of talk about this recently. Uh, and yet there are, like the clownfish and the bearded dragon, uh, those particular species change sex depending on the situation depending on the context, all right? There's also an interesting uh, group of children in the Dominican Republic who are born female and at puberty, they basically turn into males. So, you know, the question then becomes, what does that do to your, the so your social construction of sex and gender is even more complicated than that. Uh, another example is race, and one of the th examples I use there is the census, and let me see if that will, oh, it's not going to open up. 
one of the things about race hasn't changed over time in terms of the census is basically it's been a uh, adventure in um, white versus non-white, okay? And if you look at the census over time, you'll notice that uh, the first census was basically trying to decide whether you, if you were black or you were white. And over time, that black, the non-white part of that has become much more further differentiated okay, into Hispanic, Asian, those sorts of things. Yet the white category across the censuses every 10 years in the USA stays the same. It's white. So it's always been sort of this white versus non-white. And, uh, and so race is a social construct that develops and changes over time. So the, through this development, we develop meanings and we develop beliefs about the world through these transactions in these constructive realities. And the constructive reality, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about are, the, are those historically white colleges and universities. Consequently, our, our beliefs shape our transactions, suggesting various ways to meet our basic needs. As humans, as a species, we have basic needs. You know, there's food, water, things like that. But there are also psychological needs that we'll talk in this, one of them being belongingness, uh, competency, agency, I use self-determination theory needs there. And one of the things that's interesting here that I'll, I'll play with a little bit here is the difference between equifinality. In other words, there are multiple various ways to reach our basic needs versus ethnocentrism, which is basically the idea is my culture, my ideas are the best. Okay. Um, so some of these foundational uh, assumptions continued. These social constructed realities are ever changing. New things. COVID was a new thing. Okay, it, it came out of certain things, but it was a different experiences. There, I mean, at this point, and I'm sure this will change as time goes on. But there's pre-COVID. And then there's after COVID, uh, you know, of course, during the times of COVID. Uh, you know, Mark Twain made the quote, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And again, the idea is there are new things. It's not, these are open systems, okay? And for example, the internet was commercialized in 1995, all right? And if you think about three, for some of you, you can, you can only think about it, some of us lived pre-computer, pre-internet, and it was a different thing. Uh, and so, but what if it was commercialized in 1895? I mean, there's no reason why it couldn't have been. Uh, and then we could have had the famous uh, Zoom meeting between Vygotsky and Piaget in 1930, which would have been an interesting uh, adventure. Uh, continuing, it is useful to think about these constructed, continually changing realities as layered systems. And this is, you know, uh, sort of the Brof and Brenner idea. We sort of follow that. Uh, and we acknowledge that the social, cultural, historical context, the sort of the ecological, the place where we live, but we also try to bring in and think about those dynamic systems that happen in various activities, as opposed to um, many folks in educational psychology who do research and think about constructs, what's the relationship among constructs? Uh, how does efficacy relate to achievement? Uh, I like to think, in, or we like to think in terms of the, the activities as a unit of analysis. And activities can be an activity in a class. You know, activities tend to have beginnings, middles, and ends. There are things happen. It takes place over time. An activity could be over a semester. It could be over your college career. It depends on how you bound that activity. But instead of looking at the relationship among constructs, I try to look over time 
at constructs, what happens during that. So activities being the unit of analysis here. Uh, and here's kind of our general model uh, that we use. And you'll notice that it's, as I indicated, uh, it's sort of a Brenner, but it's, I, it's simplified. Uh, we have sort of three levels. There is the social historical context, uh, there's the immediate context, and that's where the activities happen, is in that immediate context. And then you can see in the cell system in the center there, these are the, you know, in, your emotions, your basic needs, things like that, those uh, dynamic transactional things, if you look within the individual. Uh, I also sort of look at the world as a universalist. And so this perspective suggests that there are some psychological processes that are universal, okay? We all need food, we all need water. Those are not psychological processes, but they're universal to our, our species. Uh, and so I also kind of look at self-determination, basic needs, agency, competency, and belonging as universal, okay? and. But they're, they're, but they're also influenced by the social, cultural, historical context. So they, there are both of those things going on, uh, as opposed to absolutists to think that, you know, these psychological processes are universal, free from cultural influences. Uh, race neutral is an example of that. A lot of times when we're looking at the relationship between self-efficacy and some other thing, uh, we look at it in a race neutral manner. Uh, and then relativists uh, focus on the other side of it, where all things are determined by the context cultural influences, all right? So I fall in that universal category. I also focus on developing what we refer to, what I refer to as critical curiosity and critical consciousness. And to help understand and dismantle colonial white supremacy and heteronormative ideology. So I've read a lot of, I'm informed by these. So I've read a lot of critical race theory, black feminism, queer theory, things like this that help me make, make uh, think about how to dismantle the white supremacist and heteronormative ideologies. And to the point where I'm not sure you can study educational activities in the U.S. without considering race, gender, sexuality, and the transactions among them. I, I, I have a hard time thinking about, for example, studying reading without those social, historical, cultural factors. Uh, now, what this leads to then is our constructed worldview then that philosophy of science we just talked about influences what we research. And one good example of that is, is our interest in STEM. You know, at one point in time in our history, uh, recent history, last 20 or 30 years, we've decided that we're falling behind in science. We need more scientists. And so most funding opportunities to this day are in STEM. So if you want to get a grant, you write a STEM grant. Uh, and so that's, it's societally decided that we want to do STEM. Well, as an old social science high school teacher, uh, the counter to that is, in, as I indicate here, in, in 2018, uh, National Assessment of Educational Progress suggested that approximately 25% of eight graders are performing at proficient level in geography. So we may create these engineers with our new STEM programs, but they may not be able to find the river where they're supposed to be driving or creating a bridge to go over it. So, uh, but again, the point here is that what we research is determined by that social constructed worldview, what we think is important. Um, thus, it is useful for me, I think about inquiry, I, I consider inquiry problem-solving activity, which, of course, makes research methods tools to help you solve problems. And so this means that 
like qualitative, quantitative, mixed, history, any of those methods are simply tools to help you solve the problem. And in this area, that's referred to as sort of a pragmatic position. And the other thing there that I'll say is that I'm a firm believer in that your research questions not only um, help you to uh, do your literature review, inform your literature review, but they also tell you what your research methods are. You don't start with the research methods, you start with your research questions, and then you develop the methods to help you answer those research questions that should help you to solve that problem, all right? So now back to my original question, how can we use social, cultural, historical, and contextual factors to develop understanding of belonging transactions at historically white colleges and universities? And so back to our three levels there, the social, cultural, historical context, our immediate context, and our self system. And the things that I'm gonna focus on there are what I talked about earlier, the colonial white supremacist and heteronormative ideologies as the social cultural factors, social historical culture. In the immediate context, I wanna talk about a construct that comes from the sociology of education and talks about educational, education, educational white spaces. And also out of that sociology of education is the idea of microaggressions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And when, in terms of the self system, what I wanna focus on is the idea of belongingness, all right? So the, and I'm gonna do this kind of from a historical perspective. And so, uh, the colonial white supremacist and headed normative ideologies uh, basically um, this begins with the idea of the process of othering and dehumanizing in what is now the USA. Okay, so this is even at the beginning when we started coming over. Uh, uh, people from England, Spain, wherever they were coming from, France, the colonials, uh, they came in with an ideology. They came in with a, uh, not only a religious ideology, they came in with a capitalist ideology. Uh, so, uh, and the way you do that is you begin with the idea that we are civilized and they are uncivilized. It's hard to exploit someone if you see them as equals, okay? And you can, this language continues even today. Uh, in recent conflicts around the world, one of the things that you'll find is that they will talk about the other as being animals, they're less than human. So civilized versus uncivilized. We are Christian, they are pagan, okay? Their religion is not right. It's there's something wrong about it. Uh, and then men are leaders, women are supporters. And again, keep in mind here that for the first long history of our country, the only people who could vote were white male landowners. Okay, uh, women got the vote in 1920. That's when that started. Okay, so barely over 100 years if you think about it in that terms. So one of the, this stereotype of, and so basically the idea was that the uh, indigenous folks were not using the land right. They weren't making profit. Remember, there's that capitalist motive that also goes with the rice, colonial white supremacist ideology. So the stereotype that served the European profit model was that indigenous people were wasting their land. They could be making profit off them. And so, we should take it from them because they're uncivilized, they're pagan, they don't know what they're doing. We need to take care of them or later on, we need to eliminate them, okay? Uh, and so remember that, that equifinality versus ethnocentrism. They were living here fine, there was no problems. I mean, they got in spats with each other and things like that, that's, that's but uh, they were meeting their needs there. And so uh, 
so let me give you some legal history here. I want to get some history in here. So Massachusetts was the first colony to legalize slavery. That happened in 1641. In 1790, uh, the Naturalization Act, and naturalization meaning uh, you can become a uh, you know, a citizen after a certain amount of time. It divides, at this point, this was in 1790, denies Native Americans U.S. citizenship. Native-born children of enslaved American women retain their slaves, remain slaves without citizenships, and excluded Asians from naturalized citizenship. Okay. Then in 1855, the Supreme Court ruled that Chinese were non-white. And again, remember that white versus non-white. And for a, a long time in this country, Irish were considered non-white. And part of that was because of their Catholic religion. Uh, early colonials from Britain were Protestant. And even to this day in cities in England where there are multiple soccer teams, there's a soccer team that emerged from the Protestant side of town and there are soccer teams that emerge in the Catholic side of town. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so th then the one I'm gonna focus a little bit more on is this Morrell Land Grant College Act. And basically this made public land available, okay? This public land that was stolen from the indigenous folks and was able to, states were able to get that land uh, and established universities. So like the University of Arizona, University of Virginia, many of the predominant uh, universities and states were land grant universities. A couple of other ones in 1897, Texas courts, state governments also got involved in this, declared Mexican Americans as non-white. So before this time, they were they were white, but then after 1897, then they become non-white. Uh, then in 1935, California law declares Mexican Americans to be foreign-born Indians. Okay. Now again, keep in mind that folks who lived in Texas, New Mexico, it's in the name New Mexico, uh, and and also like Arizona, many of these people have been living there for decades and decades. So uh, the they didn't cross the border, the border crossed them, okay? And down at the bottom there, spring has uh, 2022, a lot of this stuff is coming from him. It's a really interesting book. He's on like his, I think he's working on the 11th edition of this book, but it's really interesting. If you wanna read some of that history, uh, that's the place to go. All right, so, uh, Wilder then contained contended that the racism, and this is I'm getting back to the idea of these universities. So the racism was not on the side. The colonial colleges were funded directly and indirectly by the slave trade, sometimes literally built by slave labor on stolen indigenous land and kept afloat by trustees, donors, and administrators who were active in the slave trade. Uh, so interesting. So who attended these schools? What I'm getting to is this uh, idea of white spaces. So basically, who attended these two schools were white men. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't too out, out of character for white men from the South to bring a, uh, in, begin, bring slaves with them so that they could take care of them while they were at the university. Uh, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on the Georgetown College story. Uh, and so it was founded in 1789 by the Jesuit priests of Maryland. By 1810, they were having trouble making any money when their tobacco plantations and their failure and getting in debt. So eventually they sold 272 enslaved men, women, and children to two planters in Louisiana. Sale bought them sufficient money so they would get them out of debt. And in 1838, they shipped them to Louisiana. Okay. Now, 
Georgetown has gone through sort of a reckoning here. And so here is their, right now, their land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge that Georgetown, as we know it today, exists on the unceded homelands of indigenous people and was built to the forced labor of enslaved individuals and funded by the sale of 272 men, women, and children. All right. Uh, so also what this, what uh, this it's, there's also this naming. Okay. So these universities, not just Georgetown, but other ones, white man, uh, and what they started to do is they name the buildings. So naming becomes an important part of that. So these two buildings were named after, um, one was named after the Jesuit father who brokered the sale. And the other one was the president at the time, uh, McSherry Hall. And if you want an interesting read about naming, uh, uh, Django Paris in 2019, naming beyond the white settlers, colonial gaze and educational research is, is, a, is a nice little read for that. So in other words, what they've done, they've not only acknowledged this, they've renamed some buildings and this is going on, was going on before this current backlash on, against DEI and those sorts of things. Uh, so that's the context in which these universities were built, published. Uh, and so now what I want to go into is that immediate context and talk a little bit about um, the, the idea of white space and my, a bit on microaggressions, more on white space. So we're moving now from the social, cultural, historical context, white universities, white space, er, and moving into that immediate context. And so white space is a perceptual category defined by the overwhelming presence of white people and the relatively relative absence of black or marginalized people, all right? Uh, building on the notion that space is racist. And again, these are coming from uh, sociology of education folk. We argue that historical white colleges and universities do not function as inclusive environments, but rather as white spaces. Uh, and these white spaces involve university-based activities, practices, curriculum, names of buildings, names of plazas, names of different things. Uh, and through that then, and predominantly uh, white students. And through that then we begin to see these various microaggressions, which are simply statements, actions, incidents of direct, subtle, intentional or unintentional discriminations, okay? Um, so white spaces then, uh, Anderson, I, I, I like this quote, white people usually avoid black spaces. Okay? We don't drive through that part of town, for example. Uh, black people are required to navigate the white space as a condition of their existence, okay? So, White spaces then are meshed with a history in demography, curriculum, climate, and a set of symbols that embody and reproduce whiteness and white supremacy through the curriculum. Okay, what do you read? What's the you know the you know what's the I can't I'm blocking on the name, but what do you read in your English class? You read oh white dead guys. Uh, and so things like that. So the curriculum, not only the building, the statues and things like that all uh, make it a white space. So, and this carries into also, for example, here's a, uh, this gets at the, uh, these are the National Center for Educational Statistics for full-time faculty. And this is the fall of 21. Uh, so 73% of full-time faculty uh, were white. Okay, 35% female, 38% male. Now this, it's interesting, the 73 is almost exactly the percentage of white teachers in public schools as well. The only difference is that they are predominantly 
female. Now, you'll notice that on the end there, overall whites are overall 78%. So you see a, a over representation of white faculty. Asian, 12%, and that's, again, an uh, overestimation with 6% of the population. When we get to Black and Hispanic, <clears throat> overall, that's 12% Black, the population, but only 6% of Black faculty members, only 6% Hispanic faculty members. So if you're a Black or Hispanic student going to uh, one of these historically white colleges, the chance of you having a Black faculty member or a Hispanic faculty member uh, is somewhat small. And I, I didn't know, don't have the stats on that, but my guess is that most of those Black and Hispanic folks are probably in the, uh, many of them in the College of Education to be. Uh, so again, white spaces. All right, so I'm gonna move down into talking a little bit about belongingness. So how do we take the this white supremacist ideology, these white spaces, and what does that do to your belongingness, all right? And I'm gonna use some of our race reimaging constructions that from Jessica and our publications. Uh, and remember, race reimaging is this idea of that traditional education concepts are recon reconceptualized to include racial influence, social, cultural, historical perceptions. Uh, this requires merging of critical theories like critical race, black feminism, uh, into with traditional concept of like race neutral theories like belonging has been for a long time, considering the social, cultural, historical context. The aim is to understand, better understand how race influences the experiences of individual policies, systems being studied. All right, so race and Tinto, I've been reading Tinto since I think I was an undergraduate uh, and he's one of the higher eds. This, I'm gonna focus on higher ed here. Uh, and his integration theory suggests that persistence is influenced by social academic integration or assimilation into the uh, campus environment, which basically means that you assimilate into, you work to become like the campus or the people on the campus, All right, which is you know, a good idea except if you're Black, Hispanic, or other marginalized groups, uh, that doesn't work quite as well. Um, so what we found there is that, um, you know, in marginalized folks do not necessarily feel belonging on these historically white campuses. So one of the recent studies was by Carlton Fong and colleagues, and and he was informed by tribal crit found tribal crit was found that the traditional factors, the Tinto factors, close instructor student relations, that assimilation uh, is useful, but it's only useful when there's also indigenous specific factors such as community, family, identity, connectedness. In other words that the university is willing to change or accommodate, again, we're back to Piaget here, assimilation and accommodation, uh, these feelings of belongingness. So what they found was that they did better when the, there was some effort on the part of the um, college space to make a place for them so that they could accommodate them. Thus, incorporating social, cultural, historical, and contextual perspectives help re-image the uh, traditional ideas about belonging to reflect the unique experiences of indigenous students. Uh, also, similarly, Gray, Hope, and Matthews uh, dealing with uh, 
middle school kids, I believe. So I didn't include that because I wanted to focus a little bit more on um, college age kids. Okay. So what I wanted to end with is, um, so what are the implications here for graduate students, for example, like many of you, uh, how do you flourish in these white spaces? And um, in 1997, Beverly Tatum published a book called Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Uh, which bothers white folk. They don't know what are they talking about? What are they doing over there? Why are they together? Well, basically they're developing a sense of belonging. That's a place to talk about the issues that are important to them. Uh, and so, so that facilitates that sense of belongingness. And when I want you to, my, my thinking here is this idea of developing a squad. And a squad is basically a group of people that it's sort of the ride or die people you, you hang with, you talk about these things. And so how do you do that? Um, and that is reflective doing the process of doing that also is the idea of agentic regulating. So another one of the um, basic needs from self-determination theory. So here are some suggestions that uh, Dr. Lanehart and myself in our forthcoming chapter talk about uh, finding mentors who will support who you are and what you want to do. Okay. Uh, you know, if you if you're looking for a mentor and you want to look at uh, indigenous students or indigenous teachers or black teachers and they tell you you need to have a white control group, uh, find a different mentor. <laughs> uh, and here are some other things you can know. organize monthly meals at marginalized owned business, going to a black owned restaurant or a Hispanic owned restaurant or whatever. Uh, again, you're trying to build a group of people who you can talk with and do this. And you may need to go outside of your department, depending on what sort of students are in your department. You think wider in the college. And one of the places where you can meet these folks is in your methods classes. Generally methods classes are open to lots of different departments. Uh, and therefore you can do it that way as well. Uh, organize weekly daily writing sessions uh, at a local coffee shop. Now you can do it on Zoom. You can sit in the comfort of your home or wherever your apartment or whatever you're doing and log on at the same times. The, the logging on at the same times pro provides accountability. As long as you don't chat the whole time, you're supposed to be writing. So <laughs> keep that in mind. But uh, Organizing a lunch, creator get involved in affinity groups. And notice one of the things that the backlash on DEI is was focused on is removing affinity groups, uh, which is, you know, that's a whole nother talk. Uh, find conference running buddies. Uh, for example, if you're going to your first conference, you need to find somebody to go to sessions with. Uh, you need to find somebody you can talk with, uh, like similar things. It doesn't necessarily need to be from someone from your university. Uh, you guys are meeting different people in this forum, uh, but you want somebody with you. And um, now the running buddy is there to help you to get involved, meet people and talk to people. Uh, they're not, if your running buddy wants to go to the corner and not interact with anybody at a party at a conference, then that's probably not going to help as much. And then the last thing I'll say is make sure that you pass this back to new students. The new students coming in are going to be in a place where you're at now. And so when they come in, reach out, help them develop these sorts of things as well. I'm going to stop there. So if you have questions. Hey, okay, here's where you tell me about the three holes in my thinking.
Only three. Um, I, sorry, sorry, Renee, please. Oh, I I had a question. I was just wondering, like, given the current political climate that we're going to soon be entering into in 2025, um, like, where do you see, uh, you know, DEI programs and, um, you know, what what does that mean for like higher education just in general? Yeah, go right to the heart of it. <laughs> Don't mess around. Go. Yeah, I. those are thoughts that uh, Sanjay and I um, roam around in our heads a lot. You know, what, what, what do we do here at this point, at this juncture? Uh, this is not the first backlash. It happens anytime there's some steps forward, there's a backlash. Um, so I'm, I don't have specific strategies, uh, but this isn't the first time. And so, um, you know, I think working, uh, I think it takes people in the departments, in the colleges to, you know, to do things, to say things, to, keep the pressure on and keep doing those things. Uh, because as I, you know, with this idea, for example, replacement theory, those sorts of things, those ideas are not new uh, and, and they will continue. Uh, but they're, uh, it's important to keep doing what we're doing as, as we talk about these things. I wish I had a five point plan to, to say, but I, I I don't, and and it'll be interesting. As I said, is it's going to be an interesting few years here, uh, and some universities in some states are caving. Uh, you know, this means that we need to be prepared to continue to vote, um, and hopefully, the, these sorts of things will start going the other way again. But uh, as I said, I don't have a five point plan on that. Um, Dr. Schutz, first, thank you for the talk and for the insight. Uh, um, I don't have three points. I'm so sorry. I didn't do my homework. Um, but I do have questions that I think might interrogate some of the uh, um, other components you brought up. So I have a few. I'm going to start with my biggest one. And I know that you are someone who comes from a social studies background as a teacher. So I'm curious, part of the comments that you're bringing in relation to issues of uh, socio-historic and political perspectives and contextualization of people in their time is of course gonna bring an element of presentism. And I'm curious as you see it, how do we uh, reconcile the issue of presentism and the fact that what people are doing when may be appropriate in their eyes and morally good and in a sense, we are creating a social and a moral um, appraisal on people of the past that may not have been appropriate for them at their time. Yeah, I think I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I think buying, selling people is wrong. I don't, I don't care what. I think trying to eradicate whole cultures is wrong. Uh, and so I'm not sure what era we are in, but I'm confident in my belief that that's wrong. Okay. Uh, and in, as a matter of fact, if you, if these folks read the teachings of Christianity, I'm not sure how you can bring those two things together. I think we're going through another era of it right now where uh, if you are actually living what you're professing, uh, that wouldn't be the case. So I, I, I think there are some, yeah, it's, 
it's it's a good question and it's a it's one of those uh you know philosophical moral questions that uh I just think there are some things that are, are wrong and they will be wrong now and they'll be wrong a hundred years from now if we're then, still then, then let, me, let me ask a question that might be more poignant to what you're bringing up because I think there's a lot of value and yes I don't think I would disagree with anything you're saying in that regard let me say it a little differently then generally I know many of us here are, are in the space of educational psychology not everyone but generally like psychologists um, don't make don't take a moral stance. When we look at moral psychology, it's generally more relativism. There's a moral psychology versus moral philosophy is different. And I know critical theories, a lot of ones you're recruiting into your thinking, don't do what psychology does, which is creates relativism, but say like, no, this is wrong and this is right. I'm curious, how do you reconcile the epistemological tension between like the psychological lenses that we use with also the critical lenses that are so important in reframing how we say what we say and what we do? Well, I would uh, suggest that psychology is not, uh, I mean, that's where eugenics came from. Uh, that's Thorndike, this idea that, you know, the white folks are the smart, smartest, you know, that whole thing comes out of psychology. I think that's part of that philosophy of science. This belief, uh, this ethnocentric belief that what we do is science, we are searching for truth, uh, whether, you know, I, I'm not a big proponent of truth basically because the idea is it's continually changing. So what we might think is truth today may not be in, in the future. Um, so that sounds very relativistic, uh, but I, I think um, I, I struggle with some of the perspectives of psychology in the sense that it's not only relativix, but it's also very reductionist. In other words, we try to look at smaller and smaller things. And so we end up with these constructs that we're looking at the relationships among them. And, you know, for example, many of the surveys that we like in psychology, educational psychology, uh, were created by asking students in intro to psych or intro to ed psych courses, which are predominantly white male, white female students, to create these measures that we are under the illusion that we're going to find truth from. So um, I don't know if that helps uh, or if I <laughs> answered your question, but I talked a little while, and so maybe you forgot exactly what you. <laughs> I, well, no, there, there's a negative truth in there which I really appreciate, especially in regard to part of the challenge that psychology's founding has problematic components, and therefore maybe it's important that we acknowledge those, and therefore we say no, it's okay to take a stance. And to your point, and I think it's also really appropriate for this sig. We're not looking at things reductively. We're looking at the systems and the complexity yep. of things, and the exactly. dynamics. Yeah, so you're speaking my language. So thank you. But even some of that uh, complexity, what I'm trying to get at, and I don't think I'm, I've done it. I think I'm trying to play around with it is, how do we bring those historical factors? Because they create the context which results in some of these outcomes. So we, I don't think we can ignore them because, and, but the question becomes, how do you get that in your model and in your thinking? And that's the thing that I, that doesn't really keep me up at night, but maybe it wakes me up earlier in the morning to think about. <laughs> Good. Those are good questions. I don't have answers. I, I have a thought on that. When you talk about the how, um, a lot of my work has to do with thinking about 
about data oversimplification and how do we bring in the data that informs the the systemic aspects that you're talking about so you know and i'm just talking about like if you were designing a study i'm in math education i'm not in psychology but i often involve psychologists in my work right but um but if you were designing a study where you were looking at um factors that are are maybe like like you said stem right like trying to help marginalized students do better in stem right okay that's the world i live in but um why can't we bring in historical documents? Why can't we bring in maps that include historic that include like where like where people were allowed to live or tax documents or yeah, yeah, yeah. like uh, you can you could conduct a study where you of course are holding focus groups and talking to people and 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 collecting various kinds of measures, but you could contextualize and think about those kinds of data within the context of these historical documents as a way to bring some understanding and meaning as to why things might be the way they are and how to think about where to go next, as you said, to, you know, create the, a sense of belongingness now, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think the key is when designing our studies for whatever it is we're looking at to think through those systemic features and include that data in our studies. Yeah, I, in the, the concept you're talking about is, is redlining, which is a fascinating. If you can read, there are some interesting art, articles on redlining I and mean, do a Google search on it and with some of the, uh, you know, critical race theory people have done some really interesting things on that. But yeah, I, I think you're, I think you're right. And part of that, I think gets into this, the idea of problem-based learning. So you're not in mathematics, you're not just doing equations. And I know that's, uh, Dion Cross Francis, I work a lot with her, and she's a math math ed person as well. And so I I understand some of the things that you're doing. But yeah, I I think you're right. I think uh, the only problem is it depends on which state you're living in. If you're in Florida, you wouldn't be able to do that study. Well, I live in Texas, and we're still trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they're not ready to give up yet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know that. I know the feeling. Spent a lot of time there. Anyways, thank you for your presentation. I do have to go, but it was lovely to see you guys. Thank you. I need you to put up the remaining slides for us. All right. Well, thank you once again for your wonderful presentation. Um, so we want to take a moment uh, to advertise our sprint mentoring sessions. We're looking forward to another fruitful year of networking, collaborating, and expanding our understanding of the complexity paradigm. This mentoring opportunity will begin in January 2025 and run for about 12 weeks, and it will result in a cumulative work in progress style poster presentation during our SIG programming at AERA in Denver in April, 2025. So all graduate students who are members of AERA are eligible to participate as mentees. We are adding a Google form link uh, for graduate students to submit their interests. And then we also encourage the participation of faculty, mentors who have expertise in complexity theories and or complexity informed qualitative, quantitative, or mixed method approaches to analyzing data. We're hoping to close these forms by December 6 and reach back out to both the mentees and mentors by December 20th. So they can begin their mentorship in January. 
And Monday, if you want to go to the next one. And lastly, based on our suggestions during the 2024 business meeting, the Complexity SIG is now adopting a adopt a graduate student program. So far, we have two scholars who have chosen to participate in the program and are adopting graduate students. So if you're a scholar and you'd like to give back to the graduate student community, please email Dr. Emma Bullock and indicate your level of preferred scholarship. And for all new and returning graduate students who are interested in being adopted, they must register for the SIG and submit their proof of registration by December 4th. And we have added a Google form where you can do that. Also, it's on our newsletter and our socials. And for our last slide, um, we just want to thank everyone for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at our upcoming webinar next month. And we'll be sending out details with the registration link here shortly. So stay tuned in our various uh, communication channels. We also just started a um, LinkedIn. So if you're not with us on LinkedIn, you can either find them on mine or Hyundai's, or you can search for Complexity Sig on LinkedIn and connect with us there. And lastly, we have our complexity learning community, or I guess affinity group might be another way to put it, um, that will meet next Tuesday, December 3rd, from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And we're going to continue our conversation. We found it beneficial to continue reading the same book with one another um, and bringing in diverse perspectives. So we're going to be reading chapters two and three from Davis and Samara, the Complexities and Educations, Inquiries to Learning and Teaching and Research. So thank you everyone for attending today and that's all we have for you.